Ano ay may kialoha? Before I begin with my plenary, I'd like to begin with this oli, written by Kumuhula, or Hula Master, and Hawaiian cultural and language expert, Edith Konako Ole, affectionately known as Auntie Edith. If you know this oli, please join me as a way to recognize and acknowledge the sharing and learning that will take place here, recognizing all the generations that made it possible for us to be present here today. E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e O na me ahuna no e ao na mele E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai e a E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e O na me ahuna no e ao na mele E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai e a E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e O na me ahuna no e ao na mele E ho mai, e ho mai, e ho mai e. Aloha pumehana kako. O vau no o Candice Kalemamo ovahine kapu gala. No Hawaii ku ukulevi. E polopeka hope make kula nui. O kolome pia pele na kania makaina pono i o kala hui masquiam. I am honored to be the opening in plenary for the International Conference on Language Documentation and Conservation at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Mahalo anui to the organizing committee for the invitation to share about the conference theme, recognizing relationships. Mahalo as well for the warm welcoming remarks from across the campus and beyond. My plenary is titled Enacting Relational Accountability to Indigenous Languages and Their Peoples, Communities, and Lifeways. In this talk, I will recognize and acknowledge the extractive and non-relational language work that have occurred and continue in spaces like academia towards Indigenous peoples. Language is culture, an embodiment of past histories, current realities, and imagined futures that is not void of people, land and ancestral wisdom. It is imperative to understand that language is more than a system of communication that can be dissected, torn apart, only to be put back together, but is an encoded and cultural practice that unlocks our full potential and expression. Throughout the world, Indigenous communities are reasserting their sovereignty, self-determination, and inherent rights to protect their knowledges and languages from further desecration misuse, exploitation, commodification, and self-promotional gain by academia through academic publications, grants, awards, and recognition, promotion, and tenure. When invited into community, it is necessary to approach our invitation with humility to be fully cognizant of the privilege that allows us as academics and researchers to enter a foreign domain of learning. What may seem an insignificant invitation is in fact a relational response that trusts that our actions and engagement with language will be held to the highest standard, a standard that respects the community in which the language resides, along with the knowledges and wisdom which we as academics may indirectly and directly gain. This relational awareness and thinking extends outward from the language to the speaker, community, lifeways, lands, and beings that are present. Although this may be unsettling, recognizing and nurturing relationships, our connections to the human and the more than human hold us accountable and responsible to all who are present in the work we do. By transforming our practice, we enact relational accountability that provides a pathway for genuine, deep-rooted and honored relationships that are reciprocated through our ways of knowing, being, and doing. Hey Hawaii'o, 
no pahala mai au i kau mokupuni nui o Hawaii, a ka i kia manawa no hoao ma kio mo lewa ma ka aina pono i o ka lahui masquim. I am native Hawaiian from the island of Hawaii. I was born and raised at a time when Hawaiian language programs were in its infancy in hopes to reestablish a once flourishing language. My first introduction to Hawaiian language was through my mom, who was a kumuhula or hula master. Though she didn't teach through the Hawaiian language, the hula, mele, songs, oli, chants, we learned and dance reflected our Hawaiian culture, past, present, and future histories and understanding of our world. I didn't formally learn Hawaiian language until I attended Kamehameha schools as a boarder on the island of Oahu. I enrolled in six years of Hawaiian language at Kamehameha. It's important to note that I am still a learner of Olala Hawaii. Following graduation, I attended the University of Arizona in Tucson on the traditional lands of the Toan Autumn receiving multiple degrees. I express my gratitude to the NAMA program, the Native American Language and Linguistics Master's Program, where Dr. Zofilia Zapeda, uh, Dr. Uh, Mary Willie, Dr. Natasha Warner, and Dr. Amy Fountain um, were my professors. And at Aldi, other professors that included Dr. Akira Yamamoto, Dr. Susan Penfield, and Lucille Warhamaji all at the U of A for NAMA and Aldi. And I thank them for reigniting my interest with Hawaiian language and fostering an academic environment where I was surrounded by faculty and students with a passion to revitalize and maintain indigenous languages. During my PhD program, I enrolled in an international seminar with doctors Perry Gilmore and Lacey Wyman. The other facilitators at the time were Pila Wilson, Ray Barnhart, and the late Bill Demert. It was an exciting time for me as a native Hawaiian uh, because I would be able to learn from Hawaiian language educators who have been involved with Hawaiian immersion and Hawaiian medium education from its inception. This class opened up many relationships such that when I graduated, I returned back home to the Big Island for one year as a visiting assistant professor in Kahakaula, Okeli Koalani, College of Hawaiian Language at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. It was an overwhelming and wonderful learning experience for me, and I'm grateful for my time there. I would then move to Canada to begin my faculty position at the University of British Columbia, where I'd quickly learn of similar atrocities that have happened to Indigenous peoples in what is now known as Canada. As an associate professor in the Department of Language and Literacy Education, in the Faculty of Education and the First Nations and Endangered Languages program in the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies uh, within the Faculty of Arts, I am grateful again for the many learning opportunities and meaningful relations that have blossomed. I'm filled with gratitude for shared time and space, especially for being invited into community to be able to share my experiences and teachings, but to also experience and engage in language culture, education, and lens. Though my relationships extend far and wide across oceans, deserts, temperate rainforest, my heart remains in Hawaii. My birth sands and the lands where my kupuna are buried. As a Kanaka diaspora living on indigenous lands of the Musqueam, I'm keenly aware of my positionality and the complexity that it brings. The terminology that is meant to be inclusive sometimes also causes more confusion, generalization, and or division. Academic institutions and federal agencies may adopt particular sets of definitions that don't necessarily align with Indigenous understandings. With that being said, I use the term Indigenous throughout this talk. I want to direct you to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as it will provide some structural understanding of how I am framing Indigenous. I also want to acknowledge that I am not speaking for or on behalf of communities that claim me, nor for Indigenous peoples and communities and nations in general. I want to emphasize that there is no singular 
homogenous indigenous epistemology that can capture the uniqueness, complexities, nuances, and worldviews of distinct indigenous peoples. There is no one size fits all. The intent of this presentation is to encourage dialogue regarding relationships that results in meaningful and relevant change that is positive impacts on the communities that we work in partnership with. On each slide, I've in included an olelo no eau or a Hawaiian proverb in an effort to provide a summary or additional support. Though I will not discuss this in this presentation, the olelo no eau are meant to help guide, model, shape, and orient ourselves toward relational accountability, which is an ongoing process. In preparing for this talk, I endeavor to include voices of Indigenous elders, academics, researchers, scholars, community members, and language speakers. This effort follows the lead of other Indigenous scholars and scholars of color who advocated for an intervention that requires us to be mindful of our citational practices. Who are we citing? Are they Indigenous scholars? Are we elevating the same voices? What are our reasons for citing the same old, same old? This transformation practice is showcased in Daniel Heath Justice's book, Why Indigenous Literatures Matter, where he states that these important interventions are not only ethical practices, but relational ones as well. He expresses that always citing the same small circle of voices is both harmful to the health of the field and disrespectful to the many fine scholars and writers whose work informs, enhances, challenges, and complicates our broader conversations. And Olelo no Eao Nanaike Kumu requests that we look to the source. So let's ask ourselves, who informs our teachings? Who is our Kumu or teacher? And who is our Kumu's Kumu? Through this inquiry, we can follow the intellectual genealogy that has informed our methods and practices. As I share my mana'o or thoughts here about relational accountability, I want to begin by acknowledging my kupuna, past and present, ohana, family, friends, indigenous colleagues, allies, and mentors, as through their support, I am able to do the work that I do. I lift those voices that have informed my practice and language work. I introduce the Kumuhonua Mauliola here as a way to conceptualize our physical connection as human beings to each other and to the more than human, the seen and the unseen, the plant beings, mountain beings, water beings, rock beings, and so forth. This is a way for us to recognize how we are connected. What and who are we responsible for and accountable to? And how these deeply embodied and embedded connections are personified through our way of being. The image you see here depicting the Kumuhonoa Maliola is published in a 2018 book chapter titled Distinctive Pathways of Preparing Hawaiian Language Medium Immersion Educators co-authored by Kanaka Maoli scholars, Dr. Keiki Kawai'aia and Dr. Makalupua Allencaster. At the core of the philosophy's foundation lies the Maoli Hawai'i, the unique life force which is cultivated by, emanates from, and distinguishes a person who self-identifies as a Hawaiian. Written in Hawaiian, the Kumuhunua Maoliola has been published with explication in four other languages, Japanese, French, Spanish, and English for a wider audience. However, the statement abounds with language and terms rich in Hawaiian cultural meaning and nuances not easily explained in English and beyond the scope of the publication. The Kumuhonua Maoliola emphasizes three areas, the Maoli of a person, which in turn consists of four elements, Ka'au Ao Pili Uhane, the spiritual element, Pa'au Ao Olalo, the language element. Pa'au Ao Lavena, the physical behavior element. And Pa'au Ao Ike Kuuna, the traditional knowledge element. Second, 
the connecting centers of the moly. Pico E, the fountainal or spiritual connections. Pico O, the navel, passively inherited connections. And Pico A, the reproductive organs, actively created and inventive. And three, the places where our Maoli are expressed, Honua Ieve, ties of family and kinship, Honua Kipuka, ties of the community, and Honua Ao Holoakoa, the entire world. Although these aspects of Hawaiian philosophy underpin Hawaiian language medium education and are instrumental in cultivating new Hawaiian language speakers, we may find that this philosophy is similar to that of other indigenous peoples. We can see that through the Kumupunua Mauliola that we have deep kinship relations that connect us to each other, to the land, the water, the animals, and to the more than human. Let's begin with relational accountability. According to Anishinaabe scholar Nicholas Rio, he states in his article, that relational accountability references the kin-centric beliefs among many indigenous peoples, which holds that people are dependent on and related to everything and everyone around them. And this includes air, water, rocks, plants, trees, animals, and the more than human. As an academic and researcher, I am not only responsible for nurturing and maintaining my relationships with my communities in Hawaii, but to Indigenous communities that I have been invited into to work with. Rio goes on to say that relational accountability also would include his non-human network of relations. Dr. Enrique Salmon shares in his article that kin-centric ecology pertains to the manner in which indigenous people view themselves as part of the extended ecological family that shares ancestry and origins. It is an awareness that life in any environment is viable only when human, humans view the life of surrounding them as kin. The kin or relatives include all the natural elements of an ecosystem. Indigenous people are affected by and in turn affect the life around them. A cultural mode of kin centric ecology is presented that illustrates Indigenous relationships with the natural world. The cultural model of nature excludes, excuse me, the cultural model of nature includes humans as one aspect of the complexity of life. Why is relational accountability important and necessary? Why is it something that needs to be discussed, articulated, and understood? Recognizing relationships, after all, is the theme of this conference. Rio continues by saying that the principle of relational accountability emerged primarily as an indigenous counter narrative that questions extractive modes of research. Is he referring to extractive modes of the past, present, or future? In 2009, I attended the first ICLDC as a doctoral candidate to present a poster on language revitalization, technological developments among indigenous communities. I remember being excited to meet scholars that I'd only read about some from Hawaii, some from beyond. As I reflect back to that time, this would be my second conference during my doctoral program that I would attend. I didn't see many Native Hawaiians present. I was among the few. Nevertheless, I was eager to share my work on technology. During my poster session, I had a handful of people stop by for a chat. Two conversations stand out until today. An older white male academic stopped by. We chatted and I asked about the work he engaged in. This is when time stood still for me. 
In the conversation, he shared with what I would deem as unethical practice and knowledge extraction. As a young Native Hawaiian woman and emerging scholar, I had heard about these non-relational practices, but didn't think that it still occurred. I mean, it was 2009, but I was naive. While he spoke, he divulged more, and my mind was rushing to determine whether I should speak up and against what he was doing to the community he works, or should I just remain quiet as I was just a student? I felt a knot in my na'o. My temperature rise, my heart beating outside of my chest. This wasn't a place for me to be silent. I confronted him and stated that his practice or the practice that he's engaging is, is unethical and disrespectful. This part of the conversation didn't last too long. He didn't seem to bo be bothered by it and later would say that he teaches this practice and we can say behavior to his students. I was aghast. He left. I was thinking, was this real? Did this just happen at this language conference in the 21st century? Yes, it did. Five minutes later, another person stopped by and lo and behold, it happened again. I wanna make a note that this is not a reflection of the conference itself or of the organizing committee, but rather an indication that knowledge extraction continues and may be hidden and disguised in ways that we would not otherwise recognize. It is necessary for us to recognize that knowledge extraction and non-relational language work have occurred and continue among academics and researchers in places like our own institutions and places of employment. There are very pub public accounts that identify research institutions that have exploited indigenous communities for the sake of scientific research with the purpose and intention to write and publish articles, chapters, and books, and to obtain further grants. This has of course caused concern for indigenous peoples and communities to work with academics and researchers. As academics, we, we know the line all too well, publish or perish. So I asked to what extent will we go to be promoted, to be tenured, to move up the ranks? It should not, and I repeat, should not be at the expense of indigenous peoples, communities, lands, and lifeways. So let's ask ourselves: do we say that we work on and for community or with and in partnership? with community. What words or terms do we use to describe those that we work with in language? Do we say language holders, language speakers, subjects, consultants, informants, or research participants? Maybe there are other words that we use. Though we may be entrenched and guided by our traditional disciplines, our practices do not need to represent a time of the past. We can evolve and change by unlearning non-relational practices and relearning how to be in relation to one another, to the land and life ways for the benefit of the community. It is not enough to change the language, the terms or phrases to describe our practice or reality, but rather to enact change in our behavior and thinking of indigenous peoples as humans equals, not less than, or flora or fauna, objects, primitive, savage, sidekicks, other, or something else. In Vine Deloria's article, Commentary, Research, Redskins, and Reality, he discusses the ethics of social science research in indigenous communities. He states that my original complaint against researchers was that, was that they seem to derive all the benefits and bear no responsibility for the way in which their findings are used. What responsibility do we bear in the communities we work with? Would our relationship with community and land change if we as academics and researchers actually bore the responsibility and ramifications of our research, good, bad, or indifferent? These practices haven't changed, or if they are, are slowly changing. How do we make deep-rooted 
effectual and meaningful change and not superficial surface level change. As an indigenous person, how do we stop the continued in infiltration and knowledge extraction? In her book, Savage Kin, Margaret Bouchak uh, shares that any person who meddles with a delicate balance between human and other than human worlds by disrespecting relationships, stealing, stealing property, abusing power, or otherwise transgressing cultural norms might be rightfully accused of behaving in effect like a social savage. One must move carefully to avoid potential offense since all persons can be unpredictable. Through an embodied knowledge of relationships through physical and spiritual connection, the words of Robin Glimmerer express that cultures of gratitude must also be cultures of reciprocity. Each person, human or not, is bound to every other in a reciprocal relationship. Just as all beings have a duty to me, I have a duty to them. If an animal feeds, if, if an animal gives its life to feed me, I am in turn bound to support its life. If I receive a stream's gift of pure water, then I am responsible for, for returning a gift in kind. An integral part of a human's education is to know those duties and how to perform them. In Hawaii, land is critical on the foundational base that sustains kanaka, or people, mo'omeheo, culture, ike, knowledge, and olalo, language. The aina, or that which feeds us, holds, knows, and tells the true stories of our past, present, and future. This painting by Marilyn Kahalevai is a depiction of an ahapua, or land division, a tract of land that extends from the mountain ridges and summits to the coral reef, in a sense, from Mauka to Makai, from mountain to sea. The Ahapua The Ahapua was a self-sustaining unit whereby the community lived in balance off the bounty from the land and the sea. In our current settings, the practice of aloha aina demonstrates and embodies a Hawaiian way of life, being and doing that has a deep and profound love for the land. These connections between people, land, air, sea, life forms, and the more than human signify respectful, relational and reciprocal relationships. If we take care of the land and sea, it will take care of us. Vine Deloria states, when the domestic ideology is divided according to American Indian and Western European immigrant. However, the fundamental difference is one of great philosophical importance. American Indians hold their lands, places as having the highest possible meaning and all their statements are made with this reference point in mind. The earth is a gift that keeps on giving. That is if we care for it. Robin Kimmerer poses the following questions in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. How in our modern world can we find our way to understand the earth as a gift again, to make our relations with the world sacred again? Can we behave as if the living world were a gift? Gifts from the earth or from each other establish a particular relationship, an obligation of sorts to give, to receive, and to reciprocate. If Aina is what provides us sustenance, why would we do anything but honor, care, and respect for that which gives us life and health? If you harm the language, you harm the people. If you harm the people, you essentially harm the land. As we move towards relational accountability, I draw upon Glenn Coulthard as he speaks of the land and our relationship to it. Indigenous struggles against capitalist imperialism are best understood as struggles oriented around the question of land. Struggles not only for land, but also deeply informed by what the land as a mode of 
reciprocal relationship, which is itself informed by place-based practices and associated form of knowledge. But it ought to teach us about living our lives in relation to one another and our surroundings in a respectful, non-dominating, and non-exploitative exploitative way. By understanding the connection Indigenous peoples have to land and all that is part of it, we can begin to really learn about the intimate kin relations and why they matter and how they nurture our well being. There are deeply embedded cultural practices in our communities that acknowledge the human, animals, and the more than human relations in a fluid but consistent way where we all live in harmony and in balance. These relations and the stories it generates need to continue to nurture the land reciprocate its abundance so that we can learn from and live with the land. Daniel Heath Justice shares that kinship is like fire. It is about life and the living. It's not something that is in itself so much as something we do, that, and that is actively, thoughtfully, respectfully. He goes on to say that relationships imply presence and requires participation. Can we say that as academics and researchers that we are present and participatory? And are our relationships only to the human or does it extend beyond the human? In Amanda Holmes's doctoral dissertation, she writes of the Kanyeka and Haudenosaunee languages, knowledges, teachings, philosophies, epistemologies, and ethical systems that exist in relation to the living presence of lands and the natural world, ancestral homelands, the presence of ancestors, and ancestral knowledge, collective narrative memory from within places of ancient relationship and meaning. Conceptualizing and contextualizing in new ways from different centers, a critical framework for renewing relationships to language and cultural knowledge deepens the healing, regeneration, and possibilities for the resurgence of community. Renewing our relationships to language, learning our language, participating in land-based learning is good for our soul. Alan Ace Goodwill and I co-created this image of the weaving where we express that our indigenous languages revitalize us. If we take care of our language, it will take care of us. This is our well-being. Renewing relationships also requires us to have a deep listening. Are we engaging in a deep listening? And who or what are we listening to? In working in partnership with community, learning protocols are critical. As shared in this video by the Edith Kanakaole Foundation, protocol is the hierarchy of relationships between the material and non-material. Hierarchy is already determined by, by the prior generations and the follow through of protocol reiterates the continuum of the thought process of what is important. The Hawaii person has throughout the generations declared that the resources required for living, that is land and vegetation, heavens, ocean, fresh water, and related elements are imbibed with their own level of couple or sacredness depending on their relationships. Protocol established and reestablishes an awareness of relationship between people, place, and things as an, and is a conduit for intergenerational thought continuum. It provides a pervading attitude toward ecological sensitivity, animal to malama and aloha aina. It communicates a code of behavior in respect to places, peoples, and things. It is a safety device which reaches into the realm of the unseen. It is a unifying mechanism giving strength to purpose. In Joanne Archibald's book, Indigenous Story Work, 
she describes the principle she learned from elders in using First Nation stories and storytelling for educational purposes. She uses the term story work, which comprise the following principles, respect, responsibility, reciprocity, reverence, holism, interrelatedness, and synergy. She reinforces the need for story work principles in order to use Indigenous stories effectively. We can extend her practice of the story work principles to that of our relationships with language speakers, the language itself, and all of the knowledge that we learn directly and indirectly from. And let's not forget the land and life ways. Are we academics and researchers culturally worthy or ready to take on the power of stories and all of its forms, oral, written, or performative? And who decides if we're ready or not? It is generally elders that are the ones who deem us worthy and ready to take on these responsibilities. But are we willing to be held accountable for actions or inactions? Will that accountability mean anything to us? There is a right or proper way to go about our research, but maybe these stories along with indigenous knowledges are not for us to tell. As we near the end of this presentation, I want for us to think back at the Kumuhonua Maliola and reflect on our connections and kinship relations. Do we embody these kin relations? These relational practices as described through my citational relations matter because for many of us who are indigenous, we have firsthand experience of what extraction practices look like and feel like. It hurts us to be taken advantage of and for our cultures to be exploited and languages to be torn apart. It is also known that at times academics and researchers may have more access to language, language resources and materials than some of our own community members. Why is this the case? Language is culture an embodiment of past histories, current realities and imagined futures that is not void of people, land, lifeways and ancestral wisdom. Language is kin, language is our relative. So I leave you with these questions for you to consider. Is the language work you are engaged in community-led, community-driven, and community-centered? How is your research co-created, co-designed, and co-developed with community? There's a typo there. Does the community see and feel the benefits of your research and work? And who benefits from your work? How do you strengthen and nurture your relations in community? Is your work erasing the people, community, and land from language? How is your work countering erasure of Indigenous peoples? How does your language work amplify community voices? Does your relationship with Indigenous peoples only exist through the language or does it go beyond? How are your methods and practices accountable within a framework of relationships to land and people? And what does it mean to be an ally in community? How do you build capacity within community for language and cultural work? How are you actively decolonizing your practice? Who gets to share, tell, and publish stories, knowledges, and languages of the community, whose name goes on publications. And lastly, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? I began my talk with an Oli, recognizing relationships, honoring the culture and community that sustains me living as a grateful guest on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunkuminum Musqueam speaking people, I would like to conclude my plenary with words and teachings from Musqueam elder, Dr. Vincent Stogan. 
whose First Nations name is Simlano. As shared in Dr. Joanne Archibald's book on Indigenous story work. Being in harmony with oneself, others, members of the animal kingdom, and other elements of nature requires that Indigenous people respect the gifts of each entity and establish and maintain respectful, reciprocal relations with each. As we near the end of our time together, I'd like for us to engage in Simlano's hands back, hands forward teaching, which embodies relational accountability to past, current, and future generations. Though we are not able to physically engage with one another today, let's connect to one another through the life force that emanates from within. We will adapt Simlano's teaching and carry the protocols of respect, relationality, responsibility, reverence, and shared purpose through digital means toward connective and collective action. In joining our hearts and minds, we hold our left palm upward to reach back, to grasp the teaching of the ancestors, symbolizing the knowledges instilled imparted and shared and the guidance and help we received from those that are no longer part of our physical world. We are then given an opportunity to embody these teachings and responsibilities of putting this into practice in our everyday lives. We then hold our right palm downward to pass on these teachings, knowledge and values to the generations that come after us so that our teachings and knowledge of our ancestors continue. We recognize our relationships this way. Mahalo Anui.